For the past month, we have been taking a look at Paul and his letter to the church of Ephesus, where in his letter to the church of Ephesus, Paul, he was focused on the body, the church body, and how there should be love, how there should be unity in the church so that there can be growth, so that there can be edification, so that there can be uplifting within the body of Christ. Now in our Sunday School lesson this week, we're gonna take a look at Paul's letter to the church in Coloss. We're gonna take a look at his letter to the Colossians, where in this letter, Paul, he's not focused on the body any longer. We'll see here in our lesson this week that Paul, he turns his attention to Jesus. He turns his attention to Christ, who is the head of the body. He is the head of the church. We'll see here in the 15th verse of our lesson this week, where Paul, he states, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. This is Paul, he's speaking about Christ. And Paul, he said there that Christ, he is the image of the invisible God. Jesus, he is God in the flesh. As John wrote in his gospel, in the first verse of the first chapter in his gospel, said that the word was with God in the beginning and the word was God. In the 14th verse of the first chapter of John's gospel, John, he wrote that the word, it became flesh. So God became a flesh and dwelt among them. He dwelt among his creation, but his creation didn't receive him. And so again, it was a major stumbling block back then, and it's still a major stumbling block today where people are unable to accept the fact that God came to this world and that he dwelt in the flesh in this world. Now in his first epistle, in the fourth chapter of 1 John and the third verse, you see where John wrote about those who speak against God coming to the world in the flesh. And John, he said that those who do this, they are of a certain kind of spirit. And you'll see there that John said that they are of the spirit of the antichrist. Jesus, he said to those in the fifth chapter of John's gospel in the 32nd verse, he said to those that doubt his witness that there is another witness that is of him. Jesus, he told the people during that day that he has a fourfold witness. When they were questioning him, when they were doubting who he was, Jesus said, I have a fourfold witness. He said, John the Baptist, he witnessed of me, but they killed John the Baptist, right? And then Jesus, he turned around and he said, well, the scriptures, they witness of me as well. We have to remember that the prophets, they prophesied of the coming of Christ. But again, the people, including the religious leaders, they doubted the prophets, I guess, as well, because again, they did not accept Christ. They did not receive Christ. When they doubted John the Baptist, when they doubted the scriptures, Jesus said, hey, I have another witness as well to that. The other witness that, John, that Jesus spoke about was his works. He was going around. He was performing what we would say were miracles. He was, he was doing things that only God in the flesh would be able to do. But guess what? The people, they said, hey, he's a demon. He's, he's, he's Beelzebub. They, again, they, they denied his works as well. So when they denied John the Baptist, when they denied the scriptures, when they denied his works, Jesus said, hey, I have another witness. My witness is the father as well. And so when he said that, they were turning around, they were looking, hey, where is your father? So Jesus, he had a fourfold witness, but again, there were people during that time that denied him. Then there are many people today that say, hey, if only I was there to hear him, if only I was there to see him, if only I was there to see the miracles, then I would believe. No, you wouldn't have. There were many that doubted his fourfold witness at that point in time when they were able to see him, when they were able to see the works, if they doubted the fourfold witness, there's a good chance that you would have doubted him as well. Now we'll see here in the 16th verse that Paul, he wrote of these things. He said, by him all things known and unknown, seen and invisible, those things they were made. We'll see him say there in the 17th verse, that he, that is Christ, that he is before all things and in him, all things consist. We must understand that Jesus, he is sovereign. 
He rules over all things, all things known, all things unknown, all things seen, all things invisible. He is the head. He is over all things. In him, Paul said, all things consist. We'll see there in the 18th verse where Paul, he says there that Jesus is the head of the body. That is the church body. He is the head of the church. And, and we've seen this in, in a recent Sunday school lesson a couple of weeks ago, where we were talking about loving in submission. We were talking about living in submission. And Paul, he was comparing husbands to Christ and how Christ was the head of the body, the head of the church and all that Christ did for the wife. So we've already seen where in his letter to the church of Ephesus, where, where Paul touched on this notion. And we see Paul focusing in more on that notion here in his letter to the Colossian church, where Paul, again, there in the 18th verse, he says that Christ is the firstborn from the dead. He is the first to be resurrected. He is the first to show power over the grave, to show power over death, to show power over sin, the penalty of sin. We'll see there in the 19th verse where Paul wrote that it pleased the Father in Christ that all fullness should dwell. So Christ, we must understand that he truly is holy, that he is righteous. Fullness, it dwells in him. That means that perfection, Christ is perfection, and it pleased God to give the world his only begotten son who is perfection. If you, and I said this in, in my sermon recently, last week, that if you desire to become holy, if you desire to become righteous, then you must follow in his way. There is no other way for, for you to go if you desire to become holy and righteous. And, and many of us, we desire that, and many desire that unknowingly, where we desire to live on for everlasting life. The only way that you can live forever, if you desire to live forever, is living forever spiritually. And again, in order for you to live forever spiritually, you must be with God. And the only way that you can be with God is to become perfect. It is for you to become holy and righteous. And again, the only way that you can do that is by following the example of the one who has already done that, who has shown that there is a way to, to being that. And that again was Christ. We must follow Christ. It is a requirement. If you desire to become holy and righteous, if you desire to live on for eternity, it is a requirement that you follow the way of Christ. Now, Paul, he tells us there in the 20, 20 verse that there, this pathway to becoming holy and righteous, the pathway to perfection, that it wasn't always available to us. We'll see him say there in the 20 verse that it has now become available to us because Christ re reconciled, that is that, that Christ, he restored all things, whether on earth, Paul said, or things in heaven. By himself, Christ reconciled, he restored all things to himself. Christ made peace through the blood which he shed on his cross. So what Paul, what he is saying here to us is that, that Christ, he has made a pathway possible for us. He reconciled all things to himself, bringing harmony between those things that are of heaven, which again is holy and righteous, and then those things that are of the world. Now he's brought harmony between sin and righteousness. Which one of those things do you think that we are of? The things that are of heaven or the things that are of sin? Well, we are of the things that are of, that are of sin, right? And so Christ, within his death on the cross, within his shed blood, he brought back harmony between the things that are of heaven, those things that are heavenly, and those things that are of sin, those things that are of this world. We once were glorious. When God created man, he did not create sinners. He created us in his image. And Adam and Eve, they had the image of God at one point in time, but we know the story, right? We know that they fell in the garden. 
And when they fell in the garden, they lost their holiness. They lost their righteousness. They, they lost their glory. And in losing their, their righteousness and losing their glory in becoming sinners, there was a barrier that was raised between man and God. That barrier, it is spoken of in the 59th chapter of Isaiah and the second verse. Where in that, that chapter of Isaiah and in that verse, it is said that our iniquities separated us from God and our sins, they hid God's face from us. So when we take a look at that 21st verse there, we we'll see where Paul, he speaks about what our nature did. He speaks about what our nature of sin, what it did to our relationship with the Lord. As I just expressed to you, there's a barrier that was raised between us and the Lord because of our sin. God will not dwell with sin. And so the sincere believers, those who are, uh, who are of sincere faith, Paul was saying to us that at one point in time, we were once alienated. We were once separated from the Lord. We were enemies of God, Paul said, there because of our wickedness, because of our wicked works. But we'll see Paul, he, said, he says there in the, the 22nd verse that Christ died on the cross so that we can pre, be presented holy, blameless, and above reproach in the sight of God. Christ, as I said, at Christmas time, he was given to the world for a specific purpose and a reason. And we see that being spoken of here in our lesson for today, for this week, where that reason is to restore us so that there is a pathway made so that we can become holy and righteous. Our sins, they again, they once blocked us from God, but because Christ gave himself for us, we are no longer blocked from the Lord. We have an opportunity today to where we can walk down the pathway to the Lord, where Jesus again said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He, Jesus said that he is the way to the Lord. No man can get to the Father except by him. If again, you desire to become holy and righteous, you must follow the way, the way of Christ. Which we'll see Paul, he says there in the 23rd verse that, that we must continue in faith. We must be steadfast. We must be unmovable from the word of God. Nothing should, should shake us from the word of God. We must be steadfast in the word of God. And again, like I said in my sermon last week, I talked about being on the path of Christ, being on the pathway of righteousness and, and how that pathway is a narrow path. Sin surrounds us on that pathway because we entered into the narrow gate. And that narrow gate, that narrow path, it may seem imposing to us, but again, we must follow the way of Christ. And if you follow the way of Christ, that pathway, it will open out for you, okay? And again, if you follow the way of Christ, then that sin is not going to do anything to you. Sin will certainly try to be a hindrance on our journey. Sin will certainly try to be an obstacle for us. It will try to block our path. But again, if we're following Christ, that means that Christ is moving before us. Again, he is the head of our body. And so, so we should follow him, okay? If, if you go around and you say that Christ is the head of your life, then Christ better be at the lead. You better not be breaking off and, and going your own way. That's not sincere faith. We must be sincere in, in our faith. And again, if we are sincere in our faith, then we're following Christ who is going before us, who is clearing out the path for us. He's directing our paths. paths. He's not going to, to lead us astray. He's not going to mislead us off into destruction. Christ, he is leading us to life. And you and I, we must submit ourselves to the way in which he is going. We must submit ourselves to the course and we must stay the course. Again, if we desire to become holy and righteous, if we desire life. Now, now Paul, he said there in the 24th verse, we'll see where he makes that reference to, to his afflictions. Once again, this is another letter where Paul was in prison. He wrote this letter while he was in prison. 
But we see him say there in the 24th verse something that is very similar to what we saw him say in his letter to the Philippians, where he rejoices. He said that he rejoices in the sufferings that he was going through because his suffering, he suffered with a mind that was for Christ. His suffering, he suffered with a mind for the church. And like I said, again, in my sermon last week, the journey that we are on as sincere believers, it's not going to be easy. I always, I, I never try to hide this point from anybody. If you are going to say that you are a child of God and you sincerely move in that faith, I promise you the journey is going to be a difficult one. You are going to face some things in life that you couldn't imagine facing. You are going to go through some things in life that you couldn't imagine going through. But again, understand, accept Christ being the head of your life and follow him. And when you follow him, you will see blessing after blessing as you will continue to overcome all of those obstacles that, that try to block you, all of those things that try to be a hindrance to you. You will not only endure, but you will persevere in all things. You are going to continue down that pathway, receiving blessing after blessing. And as Paul, as he said, no matter what it was that he was going through, he was able to still rejoice. I promise you, it takes a level of faith to be able to recognize in all things, God has made a way for you and that you are blessed and highly favored. When you recognize that, the day that you recognize that, life will start to get a whole lot easier for you. Faith will, will begin to be a lot more easier for you because you realize that you will overcome that next affliction that is surely and certain to come. Paul, he said there in the 25th verse that, that he was a steward of the Lord. Paul, he speaks to, to being in the stewardship of the Lord and he speaks to fulfilling God's word. In the 27th verse, he said that as stewards of God, we have a very similar task. We are to make known the riches of the glory of Christ, Paul said to all people. And so this is a task that Christ gave to us, right? We, we, we call it the Great Commission that is found in the 28th chapter of Matthew's gospel in 19th and in the 20th verse, where we have been given the task of going out letting the world know the good news of God, letting them know that Christ, that he saved us. We are to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And I'm not talking about the water baptism, I'm talking about his doctrine. It's not a doctrine of hate, it is a doctrine that is of love, where Christ, he gave everything for us so that we can have life, not life in this world, but life spiritual, life everlasting. So if Christ, if he's so dedicated to us, why aren't we as dedicated to him? Christ, we like to say he is the head of our life, but is he really the head of your life? Is, is your life, are, are you being guided by Christ? Are you really being guided by Christ? And like I said again in my sermon last week, there's a price to pay when it comes to following Christ. That price being our obedience. We must be obedient to his way. We must submit ourselves to his way. The way in which we go, it should be in the way of Christ. The life that we live, we should live it in a Christ-like manner. He really should be the head of our life. And again, if he is the head of our life, then, then you and I, we should know that we have a saving word, a word that we should be sharing with everyone. Christ, he reconciled all things to him so that you and I, who were once sinners, so that you and I, we can live in harmony with him, so that those who are sinners to this day, so that they can learn of the opportunity to live in harmony with him. There is nobody living in this world today who should think that it is impossible for them to live in harmony with God. That, that should not be the case. And the reason why that shouldn't be the case is because we have the word of salvation. 
We have a saving word that can deliver them from sin, that can deliver them from that mindset. Are we sharing that word? Again, is Jesus, is he truly the head of our life? If he is the head of, of your life, then you should be living your life dedicated to his way, being obedient to his way. So again, I challenge you today, all of you professed believers who like to say it, that Christ is the head of my life, be sure, make him the head of your life. Make sure that you are living in obedience to his way. Thanks for watching this week's Sunday School lesson. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. I hope that you'll share this lesson with someone somewhere. Now, if you haven't done so already, I ask all of you to, to follow our channel. Be sure that you follow this channel so that you don't miss a Sunday School lesson, so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon or a food for thought. Be sure that you are following this channel today.